how was your vacation in Amsterdam? I think you went, right? Yeah, it was it was it was great. You know, my wife is uh, she's an artist. She's uh, an Israeli artist, and and her uh, Jan Vermeer, you know, the Dutch artist, is is her kind of muse. All of her art is is inspired by his. So I, I don't know if you're aware. There's a once in a lifetime Vermeer show going on at the Rijksmuseum over there now. Okay. They've got okay. I know the museum, but I don't know about the show. But go on. Sorry. Well, they put they got for it's it's they brought together the most Vermeer paintings ever in one place. So uh, and it's only through June, and our kids had had the week off from school. So um, this was sure. our one opportunity, right? Twenty eight, twenty eight paintings out of his thirty eight. Wow. Yeah. So it was quite a show. We went to it every day, in addition to you know seeing going around Amsterdam. Fantastic. Well, did was it? Um, it was strictly in Amsterdam, or was also in Ro Rotterdam? Because Rotterdam is more of like an architect, artistic, creative city. Yeah. No. No. It was, it was in Amsterdam. Only in Amsterdam. They have. Uh, he also they had uh, they borrowed some of his paintings from the Moritz House, which mm -hmm. is the, the big museum in. Uh, in uh, where the Hague, I think, but um, and sadly, right, right when we got there, we didn't know this. They hadn't really publicized it, but they had returned "Girl with a Pearl Earring" to the Maritz House the day before. Oh no! Yeah, so we didn't. We were thinking maybe we'd go to Delft and and maybe, but we we you know we just spent our time. Anyway, my wife had seen it when it was at the Louvre earlier, some other time. So, but it was quite something. It was it was fun. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. It's a it's a beautiful city, Amsterdam, with a lot of History, culture, and then great uh, group of people as well. A lot of uh, bicyclists, right? Like it's like a yeah. everybody bicycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, so yeah, we were gonna we were gonna you know go biking, but um, unfortunately the weather was a little unseasonably cold. Winter hadn't yeah. quite. Been, so didn't get the bike. Well, good. Get the I'm glad you guys had a good time off and time with family, and good to have you here to talk about all your fantastic yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Always happy to do that. So, so let's chat from the beginning. What got you into doing what you do? Uh, you know, whether it's animation or editing or whatever yeah, well, is that. It's a good, good distinction to make, right? Or or uh, or lack of same because I don't make that distinction. You know, between animation and, and live action, I just think of it as cinema. Um, sure. And, uh, um, and we can talk more about that later. Specifically, even more specifically, when it comes to um, computer animation, which we can talk about if sure. you're curious. There's, I have long been, you know, uh, generating my own theses about that. But um, no, film, you know, I've always been, been, you know, you know, big, always into film since my, my, my dad, my uncle always told me stories about going to, you know, the Saturday matinees when they were growing up um, uh, during, you know, World War II and post-war era. Um, but, but no, then, um, so then I, I, uh, uh, my undergrad school didn't have a film program at the time, Brandeis. Uh, so, you know, I, I made some short films with some fellow students there, the few of us that were, that were, um, you know, interested in filmmaking, but, uh, then it was, uh, it was grad school, you know, I came out to USC for the film program and, um, and, you know, from there it was, uh, so I, I, my best friend in uh, film school is Lee Unkrich. And, um, and so after film school, um, um, we both, you know, Lee, for, Lee preceded me and then, and then uh, I followed and, uh, you know, we became assistant editors in, in, in TV uh, mm -hmm. and he moved on to editing. And then he, he got a call to come up to Pixar when they were in the middle of, of Toy Story uh, because they were just in need of, um, you know, some experienced, uh, an, an additional experienced uh, editor, just, you know, because uh, they were, they were coming from, they were kind of inventing, inventing the wheel, inventing, uh, you know, inventing uh, computer animated features, which, which, as I said, are, are inventing the process. So he went up to join, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, editorial team there on Toy Story. And then, and then they, you know, he really hit it off with John Lasseter really, uh, who was the creative, you know, the driving creative force. Right. Uh, so he, you know, he, he really, uh, took a liking to Lee and, uh, with good reason, you know, very talented fellow. 
And then, um, so Lee asked me to join him for, you know, John asked Lee to, to edit his next film uh, as the lead editor, which was A Bug's Life. And uh, Lee asked me to come up and join him as an additional editor, a second editor, I think was, the, was what the official credit was uh, in the end. And um, yeah, so I went up 90, January 2nd, 1996. I think I was almost exactly employee number 200. I had... Prior to that, I had been doing, um, been been editing and um, assisting in television, a um, bunch of shows, including uh, NYPD Blue was a big one. And right. Lee's offer to, to join him came at exactly the same time that um, one of the editors on one of the Stephen Boschko shows took a maternity leave and they, they offered me uh, the opportunity to move up to the editor's chair, uh, at least for the duration. It was a really... Really, the timing was both great and terrible because, you know, I'd been looking for, hoping for that, longing for that for a long time. And now I had to tell them, had to tell one or the other no. And, and uh, but I was too excited to, uh, I had to tell uh, um, folks at, at, at Bochco Productions, to, you know, thank you, but no thank you. Because, um, you know, I was just too excited to, to see what this new form, this new sure. medium was. And also, um you know, the chance to to live in the, the San Francisco Bay Area was also very appealing too. So both. And ever since then, you know, ever since then, it's uh, you know, the 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 um you know, there's the, there's a double-edged sword aspect to it because um you know uh my career took off in uh, an animation editing but um, then I became typecast in a sense, you know, that, that it, it's kind of, I always have to remind people that that's actually not, not my training or not, not how I started out. And as we can talk about, um, I don't actually see the distinction, you know, it's the same. There's some, there are some differences in the process, but the basic principles are the same, at least with computer animation, you know? So, and, right, and, and right. somewhere in the middle of there, I've, I've, I've gone back and forth, you know, uh, I, I consider Errol Morris, the great documentarian, I consider him a friend. He's he works out of out of uh, the Boston area, but Cam Cambridge, the Boston area, and I'm from Boston. And so uh, every so often, I would go back home to visit family and 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 and, uh, and visit Errol and you know pitch in on one of his projects. That's wicked. That's really cool. Um, and I'm and and you're right about the distinction, like uh, you know whether it's animation or whether it's uh live action cinema is cinema uh right and it, it's all about storytelling and that's one of the things that from day one pixar has been so incredible at um you know when did toy, toy story come out 94 95 around well that time? 90, 95 95 yeah I started, 96, so 96. i remember yeah so i remember watching in theaters specifically and then at the same time i remember my parents, um, they had a children clothing store and uh, they had this TV on the top as you walk in. And the only two films that would play in loop all the time were Lion King and Toy Story. So I have seen that film God knows how many times just being, you know, in that store, just working part time with my parents at the time. But even if you look at that film today, for some reason, there's a big obviously there's a big difference between the animation um uh, improvement over the last few decades, right? Like, you know, between the rendering, the rendering I would say, right? You mean the, yeah. more for the texturing, the rendering, the technical. Yeah. But you don't, because the story is so good, at least for me, I don't see it. Like, for me, Toy Story 1 and 2 are like the best Toy Story films. Oh, yeah. Because um, I think the other two are, you know, pretty impressive too. But yeah, they're, they're, uh, uh, yeah, it's a good thing. I'm just know, speaking for Yeah. I'm just speaking from a story sense, like they, they just kind of struck a chord with me personally. But uh, but finding Nemo, I mean, that is just another another level of storytelling. And obviously, you know, at the time, I think it came in the early 2000s, like especially the water element was yeah. something new. It had been featured yeah. in Prince of Egypt, uh, which was DreamWorks film. But just to shoot, have the entire film in that environment. Um, how how did you, sorry, go on. Go on. Oh, it was a challenge. It was a technical challenge, you know, very, very yeah. much. Yeah. So how did you land on to finding Nemo? Was it like an obvious thing because, or was it like something you could pick? What was, what well, was that? I was, I was, um, you know, Pixar, which, you know, is one of the unique things about 
a, a handful of the animation studios, Pixar, Disney, and now it's the same company, but you know, uh, mm. a few of those DreamWorks, um, uh, that they're, they kind of operate almost like an old school, old school Hollywood did where, where people were, you know, employed by the studio, right. As opposed to the freelance, the freelance, uh, yeah. way that the industry has been working since I think the fifties, right. Or certainly the sixties. And, um, um, although Pixar didn't, made a big point of not uh not requiring not not doing contracts so so you know which is a little different i think the other studios did did or do um sure so so as a result you know you were hired at pixar and then the assumption was that you would continue i don't you know that might not have been the case for everybody i mean certainly at the end of a film if there wasn't a role for someone moving forward you know some people moved on but um, but you know, um, as, as I, I went up there, there was a tiny group of editorial team, which is basically Lee and, um, and, and, um, and then myself as the next second person up there as an, as an editor, and then a handful of, uh, uh, very dedicated and talented people who were there as assistant editors and, uh, production assistants and, and, and department managers, et cetera, that, that, constituted the entire department at the time when it was such a small place. So it was kind of um, almost like a repertory company or, or an old school studio where the thing, the question now was, well, what's our next project? And, and, uh, um, and so uh, I, I, I don't know all the ins and outs. I mean, I was aware of them, of, of the actual green light process to where Disney and, you know, the folks at Disney and Pixar chose the projects, but I know that, Andrew Stanton, who, you know, who was and is a key creative uh, person at Pixar um, and, and had been the writer or co-writer of, of just about everything. Um, he had been pitching uh, the story and he got, he got the green light to go ahead. And then it was, uh, I think, I think he, you know, we just, I, I knew Andrew because Andrew was, uh, it was a small company to begin with, you know, a small company, both from the, as a, you know, from the sense of a corporation and a small company in the sense of a company of, of, uh, a troop, you know? And so, um, he, um, he asked me if I, if I was interested in, in editing it. And, uh, and, and of course I was, and then I loved working with Andrew. He had been the co-director, the writer and co-director of, of a bug's life. And, yeah. uh, so it just, it just, uh, it just went on from there. And, and I think that was true probably for most of the crew the only little wrinkle there or not wrinkle but the only little twist there being that i believe if i have the timeline correct it's been a while um <laughs> this was the first time that pixar was trying to overlap and have multiple projects going right so toy story was the first you know prior to that they'd done commercials short films yeah. and uh and and sold hardware and software but um so Toy Story was first, and then A Bug's Life just kind of, everybody just kind of rolled right onto Bug's Life, you know, linearly, like John, you know, directed the first one, he directed the second one, all the heads of the departments kind of just moved on to A Bug's Life. But I think at that point, then they decided they wanted to, um, you know, they needed to, both from a financial standpoint and creative standpoint, you know, you couldn't, these films took years, so you couldn't right. just have, where you put out one product every three to four years, right? I think that's probably not financially viable. Yeah, so yeah. the goal was to get to one film a year or more and uh, it was gradually ramped up. And so they, they started doing, I guess it was, what was it? Monsters Inc., right? I think. Yeah. Right, Monst Monsters Inc. So Pete Doctor started Monsters, doing Monsters Inc. and Andrew, you know, and they were doing this, this kind of thing. And then, and then, so then the crew, so then they needed then there were op openings. So then openings for people to move up to lead positions, like for me to move from second editor to, to lead editor, because, you know, things were, there were multiple folks, multiple projects. So nice. that, that, that's, that was the genesis of, of, of Nemo. And, you know, it went through, <laughs> it went through quite a roller coaster of, of uh, metamorphoses as, as we went along. I bet. Yeah. And, when you when you're so, I I'm familiar with animation a little bit. Uh, my main thing is in live action, 
coach and that's what I do. But uh, in terms of editing, right, when it comes to like a film like Nemo at the time, I don't know, maybe things have changed now. Um, do you get like, do you start editing when it's like fully rendered and everything is the way it looks in the final film? No, no, it's pretty. Get, like, yeah, it's, it's the opposite actually so tell me the process okay so so we can you know you'll you'll tell me if i'm getting too granular or not granular enough right no no it's okay i'm i'm familiar with, i'm I'm in the film world myself so i yeah. should be okay no but i mean you know like, you know there's there's a you know i've been doing it for a while so there's a, a lot of thoughts on the subject because got it so this is and this is where we get into what i alluded to before which is you know the overlap the similarities and differences between compare and contrast live action animation so sure. in my mind i've i've long had a you know venn diagram uh you know overlapping circles of um of of different modes of cinema which uh, the relevant ones anyway in this case which would be live action uh mm -hmm. live action narrative i should say uh and um traditional animation to you know the kind of the two-dimensional animation sure. whether it's drawn by hand or it has computer assist or whatever and um and then computer and you know computer animation computer generated animation and and i see them as, as overlapping all all three overlapping with each other and overlapping to, you know all three overlapping in the middle and each one overlapping with the one next to it so um so to my mind um and and you have to understand that as well that um with the exception of a single, when I went to USC film school, there was, it was only a single um, animation course available. It was not, you know, nobody right. went to very few people. I should say uh, there were a couple of steps. You didn't go to USC for, for, to learn how to, you know, do animation. Right. Um, and this was, I went through in uh, 88 to 91, 92. So, um, you know, I did have, you know, this tiny introduction to, to to doing a few animated shorts, which was everybody had it was a requirement everyone had to take had to take the class. But beyond that, and and since then they've they've developed quite an animation program. But um, that's my only my only training. This is one little introductory class. I have no I have no all my knowledge of of with the exception of that class, all my knowledge of the process of an, of a traditional animation comes from learn you know just observing my colleagues. Sure. Most, most of whom, even though we were working in computer animation, most of whom had traditional animation training because that's all there was, you know, since Pixar was at the forefront and then PDI had just kind of started up overlapping with uh, Bugs Life. Since Pixar was at the forefront of, of developing, you know, computer animation, um, they weren't really teaching it in schools is my understanding. And um, so everyone we were working with had traditional animation training outside of the editorial departments traditional animation training, and they were learning on the job how to do computer animation. Whereas those of us in the editorial department had live action training and were learning on the job how to do any kind of animation editing, right? right. So, so the um, conceptually, the way I see it is, is, is that um, anim animation, computer animation editing is that it, um, it has the, um, it shares some of the techniques with traditional animation editing, but, but it, it it shares the uh, basic principles of cinema with live action. And the reason I say that is because basically the way the production works is that there are um, the actual end result. It's, it's a, it's a virtual version of, of a three-dimensional set. It's a story, you know, a story converted from right. three dimensions to two dimensions on a screen, just like live action. Uh, not with not not talking about whether it's it's being presented as a stereo you know 3d film or not that's that came later yeah but um so you've got uh virtual you've got virtual cameras shooting virtual actors virtual props virtual on a virtual set right so that's all like live action uh in in traditional animation you know it's all drawn it's all two-dimensional it's it's a direct translation nothing's you're not going from three three dimensions to two you're staying in two dimensions right so in a way, what you see is what you get. And, um, you know, uh, and the way, so what, I had to learn some new terminology there because they were still using, we all did, they were still using um, the terminology they'd learned at school that they'd learned working on two uh, traditional animation. So in traditional animation, I think this has changed with the, you know, because now computer animation is kind of the main thing they're teaching. 
So in traditional animation, the word scene refers to, my understanding, uh, refers to a uh, what we would call a shot, right? So, you know, live action yeah. or, computer, or you know, what I would call a shot, uh, yeah. personally trained animator would call a scene. And what, what I would call, what I went, would call a, a, a scene, they would call a sequence. Okay, and and I it took me a long time. I, it wasn't really till I worked on the SpongeBob, the second SpongeBob film, uh, Sponge Out of Water, which was a hybrid mix of two dimension, three, you know, two D and traditional animation, CG, live action. That yep. I saw it firsthand. You know, that was actually my first exposure to it. And and so I guess what the difference being the reason I think they call it a scene is that they have to think in terms of the background. The single camera angle. There's no, there's no slight adjust. You know, you can do a two dimensional move. You can zoom in, pan yeah. on, on, but there's no. Well, could we just turn the camera slightly to the right? You know, could we? Could we? You know, there's no tilting the camera or pan, you know, uh, uh, panning or tilting in, in three dimensions. Whereas in in uh, CG, of course there is. Um, but so that's the the end result. The end result. Uh, see, computer animation, you know, really has in a way more in common with um, with live action that way. But the process is kind of the best of both worlds because the process is um, the big difference between, uh, you know, editing animation with, with, of, of any type and editing live action is that instead of choosing from among, instead of your raw material being multiple takes, of the same sh of the same shot um and multiple shots to make up a scene um instead of multiple takes of the same shot you're actually doing multiple iterations of this of the of a single take right so you're you're actually mm -hmm. you're actually it, in a way you're actually you're, you're you're building a take it's it's only ever a single take of a shot in a way is one way is the way i think of it only ever a single take but you can swap out elements and change things you know, you can change the, the actors, you know, the, the, the voices, you can change the sound effects, you can change that, you know, you can move them around, you can change, you, you know, you can change the timing within the shot. You can also, sure. when you get to the stage of layout, and I can explain those steps, but when you get to the layout stage, you can also ask for, um, you know, the camera to be changed. You know, you can say, well, could you, could you just tilt it? Could you do this? Could you do that? Which of course... Is it, it, it's like being able to do um, uh, pickups on on uh, you know endless pickups on on a live action set and um, right. So it's the best of it's the best of you can you can't do that in, in traditional animation without it's 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 it, it would be incredibly labor intensive. It would, if you ask someone to do this, you know, just turn the camera slightly. Well, that would require somebody to make a whole brand new background drawing and then make all the change the angles on the characters and that you know. Um, yeah. So the way the way the process works is because you're rather than taking a bunch of already you know of shot you know it, rather than a linear pre-production production post-production post timeline uh, it's it may be more useful to think of editorial as a hub it's a, the production is like a, a wheel in a way it's all post-production yeah. and and um, editorial is the hub in the middle with spokes leading out to all the different departments and so you're building the film in in the editorial department in the avid or whatever you know system you're using mostly avid and um yeah and so you start out with drawings you know storyboard artists um well now i should ask you how, how detailed do you want me to be because that's this you know no, you can keep going i'm listening i'm enjoying this all right so so the so it's an animated feature is um written multiple times um in, in yep. so so live action, you know, you know, you try to get the script, you know, the, 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 the writer in a room with the script is the least expensive time, right? You try to get the script where you want it. And of course, then you go and shoot it. You may make changes on the set, you know, actors may ad lib or, you know, you know, you may have some, you may change your mind or do rewrites, but basically, you know, you shoot the, you, you get the final shooting script, you shoot it. And then in a way it does get rewritten in, 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 in the, in the editing, editing process, but there's a lot of limitation. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, you start out trying to, to do the script, but then you see all kinds of problems and you tweak it, but you're working with the existing material and maybe you have 
if you have the budget, maybe you have a couple of days of pickups, but that's rare and it's not going to, you can't redo the whole film in, in, um, and the time frames are much shorter in, in uh, animation editing. Um, you got the script, the script, you all, to my, my, my experience anyway, this may, there, there may be exceptions to this, but I haven't experienced it. The, the script invariably may be very good from a, you know, maybe, maybe fine from a story structure standpoint and, and a basic premise standpoint and a character development standpoint, but, but it, invariably it lacks the spark that if it's, if, if, if the film is good, it ultimately has, if you're lucky, it just lacks that spark. Like I, I have yet to read a script. I've read good ones and, and, and not as good ones, but, but I've yet to read a script where it was anything near as scintillating, you know, as exciting as the final product. And in fact, there's a, I have a, a humorous memory of, of um, my first day there where um, when I went in to my first day, uh, Lee sent me down in a room, in my room, my new room, uh, gave me the script and said, uh, you know, read this and then let's talk. So I read it and, um, and I'm a slow reader, it took me a while probably. And I read it and then uh, I went into his room next door and before I could open my mouth, he didn't even let me say anything. He, he put up a hand, he said, hold on, before you say anything, I just want to let you know that when I read the script for Toy Story, it wasn't, it wasn't all that exciting either or whatever, you know, the paraphrasing. <laughs> and, and he was right because, you know, there was, there, there was a great story, uh, a great story artist. Uh, it was more than a story artist. He was really a key creative person in the animation field, like kind of a legend, Joe Ranft, who was, um, you know, head of story on a lot of Pixar films and um, uh, John's best, pal from film school and uh not film school from art school uh and uh cal arts and um joe sadly joe joe passed away in a, in a tragic accident uh, a number of years back but joe who i love dearly he was everybody did um joe would always say um that every in animation you know every department every department that every person who touched the film needed to plus it which is, you know, grammatically maybe not correct, but but conceptually it is. So it it, it always got elevated at every stage, and yeah. um, you know, just a lot of a lot of this. You know, if you just think about, for example, just a lot of the visual humor, the gags, the 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 things that an animator, and, and they're not the only ones, but it's just it's just, it's an easy one to visualize what an animator would bring to the table in terms of all the like the subtle humor the, that that maybe might you you, you know you. It would be pointless to try to write that stuff out in advance, you know, codify it. You just kind of yeah. have to. It's almost like a, a performer, you know, like like what an actor would bring to, the, or what the actors do bring to the to, did bring to it. So that none of that's in the in the in the at the script stage, right? So so this so you know, getting back to this this film's being written multiple times. So you get the script, of course. In the case of Nemo, there'd be a Andrew, and same actually most of the films when I was there. Um, and, and there were fine scripts, there were fine scripts, but they still, you know, were going to be plussed. Um, so, so, um, the next rewrite or the main, I would even say the, the, the primary rewrite would be in the story department. So the first, next thing that happens is, uh, different, you know, the, the story team, which would be a bunch of different story artists, artists who are trained in basically drawing storyboards, telling, you know, telling, telling a, a story visually, um, and storyboards are also used in live action films, but um, yes, but, but in the animated films, okay. they're, they're they're more they're, it's more key in the live action films. Mostly, the storyboards would be to just to kind of work out the camera angles and things like that, and the and the and the logistics of it to make sure you're not wasting time on the set for more complicated projects. But in animation, it, it's essential. I mean, it's 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 a rewrite of the script visually. It's a visual rewrite of the script, and the story artists, you know, these were the tops in their field at, at Pixar. That's one of the key, you know, things is that, you know, even back in film school, you know, they always taught us that casting is, is really 90% of, of, of the director's job. Let's say, you know, once the cast, if the casting's right, you're almost done. Right. A lot of directors yeah. have, have noted that. Yeah. Right. So um, in the case of the animated film, the casting is, is kind of casting the crew entirely. Right. So, um, which I suppose would be true for any film, but even more so here. Um, so the story artists, casting the story artist, who, who's good at humor, who's good at this, who's good at that, right? 
So uh, they would assign that. So they would they would do be multiple iterations of of you know they would go through a sequence assign a sequence be assigned sure. to one, person. and then we would get the you know we would get the sequence in sequence meaning scene usually right yeah we get the, sequ- the sequence in and um, and we would put it together that, and that, that that would be the first step build the se- build a, build a sequence and and the elements would be the picture would be these story panels right. And it's an art in and of itself that we kind of had to figure out as we were going along how to do that, right? How to how to cut story panels a little bit different from cutting um, uh, twenty four frame per second material, you know, and um, mm-hmm. and and the, the soundtrack, which was even more key in a sense, would be made up of um, scratch dialogue, which which is you know we would just basically they would cast fellow coworkers to do different sure. characters, right, and um, and so we would record that and, and a scratch dialogue and uh, and then you you know can sound effects for the most part from sound effects libraries um temp sound effects these were all temp nothing would make it to the final film usually and then um you know the traditional um and this is the same with live action you know the music would be um you know music from other scores right in the case yeah. of uh, emo for example we were uh, we were uh you know andrew knew he wanted a he was hoping Thomas Newman would do the score. He really liked. Uh, he really thought it would be, he would be great, and he was. And so you know, we went ahead and uh, uh, used uh, Thomas Newman's prior scores that that gave some of the similar feel to what Andrew was looking for. Um, Meet Joe Black was a big one, I think we uh, you know used there, and a uh, bunch of others. American Beauty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, American Beauty was another. Um, the the. Um, I mean the whole bunch, but but uh, you know uh, yeah. there were there were a few key key tracks, and uh, you know for Toy Story two that was an easy one because since John, we knew John just want you know was going to keep going with Randy Newman, we were able yeah. to use a lot of Randy's scores, particularly the score for Toy Story, and uh, there's another fun anecdote there because when I attempt I attempt pretty much exclu- you know I, I there were there were a lot of parallels between one and two in terms of the tones so um so his score you know a lot of the temp score worked great from from uh, one, uh toys the first toy story as well as you know some of brandy's other things and i was just ever so slightly apprehensive going into the um the actual spawning session with him you know the spawning session where you actually sit down with the composer and 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 and, the, sure. and and discuss well what where are the cues going to be and what are they going to be doing because back in film school i had attended you know film school at that time was right next to the the music school um and jerry goldsmith you know the great mm. composer uh, of course. uh was he was giving a talk but not a talk a talk to the music students you know it wasn't it wasn't for the benefit of the film students so he was coming at it from his own music bent and i just heard about it because my 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 roommates were, were music students so i i i think snuck in i don't you know i don't think it was uh it, was, it wasn't a closed thing but um but i did get to hear him talk about uh uh candidly to to like to like the the composing the film score candidates um you know what his frustrations were that i think he probably would have expressed differently if he'd talking to film students and what he said was, um, I remember he, he said, someone asked him, I don't remember what triggered this, but he said, when I, when I go in to a uh, spotting session and I see, and they show me, you know, the film and, and I see they've spotted with my previous work, I get so offended. I, 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 to me, it's like they're asking me to just, just, um, you know, <laughs> plagiarize myself, just to not do anything original, just, just just do more of the same. And he said, you know, I don't know if he said he walks out on or something, but you know, he put the fear of God into me about doing that. And so it, th- that came back to me when, when, you know, we were sitting with Randy and I, you know, I was meeting Randy for the first time, I think. And uh, I was like, is he going to react like Jerry Goldsmith? Cause that, you know, that, <laughs> you know, am I going to get, get, you know, chewed out. And cause I've tempted with only with his stuff and not only with his stuff, but with mostly with his stuff from the other, the previous film. And he, and so the film, so he said, he said, 
and I can't do his accent, you know, because he 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 spent some formative years in New Orleans, and he really, you know, has that you know trademark drawl, even though he's from LA, I guess. But um, he he said a few times, and right here I'll oh, do something similar to that because the cue would come up, say, oh, you know, that's 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 kind of sounds about right. I'll I'll do something like that, and then right here I'll oh, well, you know, kind of like that. And he said. And it's not being lazy because it's the right thing for the picture. <laughs> so <laughs> breathe a sigh of relief there. Um, but in any case, so that's so uh, you know that was a digression. But but yeah, we, we we build a film with the story, you know, with the with the story panels, the uh, you know the temp the temp dialogue, you know, scratch dialogue, temp temp effects, temp score, and and. Uh -huh. And we iter iterate it there and screen it again and get the story working at that stage. And that, you know, at Pixar that goes on or went on, you know, may have changed, but it, it went on a bit longer than it tends to go at other studios. And that's probably really the secret sauce, just the willingness at the time anyway, to keep, keep working at it until we got it right. Yeah. You know, it's like maybe even an extra yeah, year. Yeah. And no, then that's, that's, that's so true because I, I was wondering, do you remember when you got that script the first time of Finding Nemo, how drastically different was it? Like, yeah. we don't have to get into specific, but was it complete overhaul or was it just like scene changes, but the main plot line was the same? Or? Well, both. Yes and no. Right. Because um, and this this, I think, happened with all the all the Pixar films, at least the ones I was involved in. And I think it was all sure. of them and I, another part of the secret sauce. So. Um, it was the same core story, but so much changed, right? I mean, from the beginning, you know, if, uh, it, it had it had a flashback structure that's completely gone. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a really key flashback structure, like you were introduced at the beginning to, I think it was 10 images with a heartbeat, you know, kind of fading up, fading down, fading up, fading down. But this may be, this may be on supplemental material, probably is on, 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 on the discs. And, yeah, um, yeah. and then we kept coming back to it to the repeatedly and then at the end it was revealed what the images really referred to you know and and uh and that stayed for the longest time for at least a year or something like that and we had um there were also other changes um um you know i think i think at the i think there was one point at which we added in you know andrew you know this is the business of nemo having a damaged fin i don't think i think I think they got added early, but it wasn't there at the very beginning. There were other right. lots of other changes structurally when when you, what the flashbacks are, uh, that sort of thing. But um, but and uh, and there was there was a big change in casting too, which which necessitated some rewrites. But um, but the basic story was what? there. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Go on. Go on. Well, so 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 the the relevant the relevant moment there was um we we finally put the whole film up after maybe a year or something and brought it down to show to the folks at disney which which was the way we would do it at that time get get feedback um sure and the meeting there and i remember i think it was uh tom schumacher and peter schneider i think we're running we're running uh, animation at that time and they said something to the effect of it's really great um you know it, i think it was it was the highest praise i had ever heard them say having been you know through mul multiple multiple of those screenings for different films uh i said really right. there's you know there are no major notes which was unheard of right and then they said okay except for except for this this and the other you know these and and it, and andrew really i think you know, as one does, one one tends to focus on the negative, right? And I think mm. Andrew focused, you know, here the nice damn it, we have to change so much. And 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 I, you know, I reminded him, you know, <laughs> he said it was pretty much, it was pretty much uh not perfect, but you know, as close as you yeah. could get at the stage. And so at that point, we made a lot of changes, too many. And this this is kind of the normal reaction. We, too many. We went down, you know, changed too much, and then yeah. backtrack for the next six months. Let's say then backtrack to so that, in other words, what I'm saying is that on the one hand it changed quite a bit. On the other hand, 
in the end, looking back, once we kind of had it all put together, those changes were not as as great as it felt at the time, right? Mm. So, you, for example, if you take out a flashback structure, is it is it is it a significant change or not? It, on the one hand, it's an enormous change structurally, right? Gigantic change, like changes everything. On the other hand, it really wasn't. It's, uh, it really didn't because it wasn't actually, it was more of a cosmetic change in a sense, you know, and a lot of those were like that, but, but so the answer is big changes and, and, and not so big changes, right? The core was always there, yeah. but much, much changed. And I think what you just said happens to a lot of us. I know it just happened to me that probably will have happened to me for, for years to come is like when somebody, you know, when you get feedback from test audience or just a small group of people, they will point some stuff, whatever it is, 10 changes or 20 changes of recommendation. And then you go back at it and then you start seeing things that you didn't see before. Either they you're looking into it too much. And then, you know, what you just said that now you look at it, those changes that you thought were changes were not necessary because you're so deeply involved into the project that yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're completely, completely, um, you just turn negative. Like you just start picking on things that, an average audience member would not even see in any way, yeah. whether it's story or visuals. Um, for for me, um, David, I, I felt I, I would like to know there were three sequences in the film that I'm I'm betting that it had its own challenges: the jellyfish scenes, sure. um, and, and then the, the shark where you have you know inside the ship the chase sure. that takes place, and um, the uh, uh, what was that scene? Um, in the end, uh, the, the 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 English Channel was it? Where do you meet the the turtles? The, 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 the oh god, um, the yeah, the not English Channel. Uh, I don't know why I called it the English it's Channel. Channel. No, it's, it's yeah. the it's the uh, exp the express the um. Well, now I forgot. I, I would have if if I wasn't trying to. Yeah, you're you're talking about the 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 underwater current. Uh, yeah, yeah, those yeah. are all yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know that they they every sequence had its own challenges. I don't know that those had more than any others because I'll, I'll tell you what the biggest challenge probably sure from a filmmaking standpoint, an editorial standpoint for sure uh, for everybody was what you mentioned right at the beginning, which is that that the whole thing takes place underwater. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you think about it, it, may not it may not you know there's of course the technical challenge at the time because every film Pixar did. You know, they were kind of inventing a new, you know, they were they were the pioneers of, of you know, how we're going to render this, this or that cloth or hair, in this yeah. case, water, water in particular. Right. Um, nowadays, you see it in all over the place. But at the time, it was a big, a big thing. I remember um, talking um, all the technical directors talking about uh, the different, you know, they, they studied, they did all kinds of, of, of research trips and things to study, you know, what. What what is going on with light underwater? You know they have the the, the so-called caustic lighting. I guess I don't know why it's you know, caustic, uh, like you know with the the the, 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 the more of the, the the rings of light and things like that that you see on the surface and, and coming down, then and, and all the different types of light and the little motes of things floating and you know. But but the huge challenge from a filmmaking standpoint, from an editing standpoint, of course, is except for when you are on the on the the surface, the, the I mean, at the bottom of the ocean, right, where you're down near mm -hmm. the ground, which whether you're walking or floating on the ground, underneath, deep under the ocean, at least, you know, that's kind of the equivalent of of of, of what we're used to. Um, there's no, there, there, you, you, you've lost most of your bearings, most of your visual uh, clues, bearings, when you're floating in the middle of of the sea uh between the the surface and the ground you know there's there's nothing to indicate uh uh geography at all mm -hmm. so that's a huge challenge you know if you've got to cut cut dialogue between um two people or two fish or two creatures that are back and forth how do you keep that from just popping looking like a how do you how do you make that look uh like like uh you know, uh, properly cut sequence as opposed to a jarring, you know, uh, jump cuts all the time. Like, wow, you know, the, they're popping all over. Like, you know, you're just replacing, like the background's the same and you're just replacing, you know, you're just replacing the, uh, 
you know, the subject, um, that, that, that took a lot of work and that, that was tough. That was really yeah. tough. Many, many, you know, both right from the beginning with the story panels, then we went to layout and to everything else. And there were all kinds of tricks about changing the lighting and things, but there were times when it's, it is really tough, you know, and, and then on top of that, then of course, and this is across the board in animation, but particularly here, you, you know, might not, might not be obvious, but, um, if you think about it, so fish, right, you know, character design's a big thing and, 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 uh, Pixar was great at it and had great character designers and, and John always had a great sense of character design. So those, those are, they're very appealing characters, right? Those, those, those fish, their whole body, their face and their body, their face is basically the front of their body. Their body is, you know, a close up. What's the difference? The, 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 the uh, shot sizes are not the standard shot sizes because what, what's the difference between a close up and a full and a, and a wide shot, right? I mean, you can see their whole body in a close up. Yeah. <laughs> depending on their angle right mm -hmm. so right away like you, you you you've got a whole different approach there uh in terms of you know you have to rethink rethink all those things so there's a lot of a lot of thought put into that yeah uh, you know so that's those challenges when it comes to like the jellyfish for example sequence um if you think about it that actually it actually takes away one of those challenges because the jellyfish then become a little a surface and a, and a reference point. Uh, yeah. But I, I will tell you this. I, I will tell you um, that, that I, I thought, I thought of um, this was an, I mentioned this to Andrew. I, this was my, this was what was going through my head. I don't, it wasn't particularly, I don't think it resonated with Andrew particularly, but for me, I was always thinking of the beginning of, of that where the, you know, where the jellyfish gradually, um, you know, fill the frame and, you know, you become aware that you're in bigger and bigger trouble. I was yeah. always thinking of, of, of George Romero's, the, op you know, uh, opening of um, the original, you know, the original Night of the Living Dead, you know, where, okay. where if, if I don't know how well you remember it. Um, it's been a long time since I saw it, so I don't probably remember. Well, it's been a long time since I saw it too. And maybe, maybe my memory is incorrect, but, um, but if I recall, <laughs> you know, it starts with, they're in a, I think a cemetery that this couple and, in the backgrounds of different shots, you gradually, you know, they're 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 having a fine time, and but then, you know, you see these what you learn are zombies at the time at the beginning. You you, you know, they just seem like uh, well, oddly behaving people, but you see one in the background and more, and, and with each shot, you know, with each cut or with every few cuts, there are more, and they're getting closer, and it doesn't seem like that big a deal until suddenly, you know, um, then you start paying more attention to them, and you realize, oh my. God, there, you know, we're in trouble now. Yeah, and that that is kind of um, that. Not kind of. I mean, that that was very much the template I had in mind for 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 the cutting of of that bit of the of the opening. You know, um, there were lots of other things going on. I know, I know, there were other interesting things going on there. I just, I, uh, it's been a while. You know, it, it, um, yeah, See, uh, yeah. I find it I, with the jellyfish scene. I find it now that I remember it. And this is probably because they just look so visually appealing, right? Like pink, and they're just so slowly moving. They're not like a shark with, you know, gigantic teeth. And I remember watching that scene. It was even when before um, Dory uh, started getting, you know, uh, shocked or electrocuted or whatever you want to call it. It was like you never felt, in at least for me, I never felt the same way as I did from Bruce you know, because of that visual representation. Yeah, and yeah, even after that scene was over, I don't know if that was intentional from you guys or it was just the way that the nature works. Is I had never felt anything about the jellyfish. I just felt that they were there. And, yeah. you know, they did their thing and they moved on. Like, it was not like a nemesis or arch. No, no, yeah. I mean, I think that's a very astute observation. I don't know that we even necessarily spoke of it in those terms we may have but but the thing is that i think um if that's very much um that's kind of across the board that's that's you know in a way a theme throughout the uh, many of the pixar films at least the ones when i was there and the ones with andrew and, and and um which is that i do know from having talked about it on on toy story 2 and you know toy story 1 as well um i know it's the case that um you know everyone was very well aware that 
a lot of a lot of the the nemeses or the bad guys, whatever, were only so from the point of view of the characters, but that actually, you know, like for example, Sid in in Toy Story, yeah. that um, you know, he 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 wasn't a bad kid because he was only yeah. around with his toys. You know, he wasn't actually torturing. Um, you know, from the point of view of the toys, he was he was almost evil, but but he wasn't because he was just a kid. You know, and 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 you know, you're not gonna tell a I mean, maybe the parents would be annoyed at him not taking care of his toys, but he's not, 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 not hurting, you know, anybody, any, anybody from his point of view. Right. And yeah, so for sure, there was a very much a respect for the natural world, a lot of research and yeah, jellyfish were, were, um, you know, I, like, like I said, I, I, for me, they were like the zombies, you know, the zombies were even the yeah, zombies yeah. Aren't, aren't actually like evil. They're just, they're like mindless in the, in the Romero films. But uh, even even more so, they're just they're just existing. It's just by the very nature, they're they're dangerous and 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 slow moving too, which is another thing that they had in common with with zombies, yeah. right? But there was a lot of there was a lot of research and a lot of thought. Andrew initially with his script, but then the, the entire production crew with uh, during the production, a lot of research into the real life creatures, the real life you know biology. Yeah real life uh, fish and jellyfish and all these things it was all there was an attempt to be pretty pretty true to life notwithstanding that some of them and, and of course the, the jellyfish are not anthropomorphized right which brews yeah. with the sharks the sharks are right right and you know it, you were talking about the lighting and the water and it's funny because when i was watching avatar when it came out what four or five months ago you you forget about certain things, you know, certain films, certain books, a certain piece of art over time, but it still remains in your memory and, and le- until something reignites it, right? Finding Nemo is one of those films, which, you know, for me, it's like up there with Toy Story, Lion King, The Prince of Egypt. Like for me personally, it's really some of the one of the top films uh, in, if you want to call it, animation ever made. And when I was watching Avatar 2, it just triggered my memory when they were showing these scenes of you know light coming in the water like yeah. there's so many of them especially there's a sequence like where sigourney weaver's character is just with the nature i don't know if you've seen avatar too oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. of yeah. course yeah. with the nature and it's like a long scene without much dialogue and that triggered finding nemo for me the first the, the first one not dory but just some scenes where the way the water the light was coming in the water in the distant yeah. background especially over that um, part where the kids were playing and you know you want you don't want to go far in the water and I, I i told myself that movie is came out in 2003 avatar came out in 2000 and let's say 23 because it's the end of the year and still finding nemo's quality of animation especially of that lighting coming in the water in different spaces was right up there with avatar for me i mean that's how good it was um it's well, just it- timeless I know there was a lot, as I said, there were years and a lot of effort put into yeah. getting. I just want to mention that. That's all. It was just yeah, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a, a funny, I mean, um, they did, <laughs> there's a painful memory. I'm joking about that painful, but they, <laughs> they got in preparation or during, during the earlier stages, they got all of us, at least, at least the department leads, um, Pixar, uh, they they trained us all in and they, they got us all scuba certified and they 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 you know we went through the whole process and it was you know it was uh, they would have they would training sessions at the studio and then we would go in the pool and then we went to monterey bay for for our you know uh, in water test whatever it's called it was all in preparation for a big research trip to hawaii to to go diving to you know to you know i think it was like a week long trip or something and I was pretty excited because not only a great trip, but you know, editors don't don't usually get get to do stuff like that. I was super uh, excited. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> no, but so so so, and, and I I almost couldn't believe it was going to happen. But I got trained, I got certified, and everything. And then um, it was like days before the trip is my recollection. It, you know, my recollection is like the day before, but I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, Graham Walters, the producer, came in to the room and I, I knew what he was going to say before he said it. Um, Cause I, you know, I've just been waiting for it for it. And, and he said, you know, I've been thinking, you don't really <laughs> need to go on this trip you know, because I mean, you could make the argument either way, but you know, it's, 
you it's a tough sell to say that the editor needs to have spent a lot of time underwater right um and uh whereas the other you know a lot of the other folks were actually you know they were they were responsible for creating the look right so uh he said you know you if you you know i, I think maybe rather than you go on the trip if you stick stay behind you know you can you can prepare some whatever <laughs> and i just sighed and i you know i was just waiting for you to say that but okay you know so i, I didn't get to go on that trip so oh. that, I, I can't i can't say he was wrong um no he was right but part yeah, of you wanted I, to go I, right. I would have been okay to go on the trip too but uh but um you know so that that was kind of a dis a predictable disappointment on that on, on that but the trip clearly had great dividends for everybody else because all the, you know, the, 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 they really, they really, um, you know, did a great job. And, and, and the part, part of the process that I didn't, you know, mention is, is the, so after the story stage, um, it goes to the layout stage and, yeah. and story stage is where you kind of get the story, the basic parts of it down, but it gets layout is when it is when it goes into or previous previous uh, some 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 studios call it previous um that's when it goes into three dimensions and that's the biggest leap right because you've been you've been cutting these two-dimensional drawings which at that stage it's still very similar to say a traditional animated film like you haven't really done anything different from traditional animated film traditional animated film you would go from those story drawings basically to more detailed drawings right and it would stay like that but in 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 computer animation it goes from there into the 3D realm. It's a virtual yeah. realm, but it's like going on the set. And and you know, we editorial, you know, that's where you get to work with with them about, hey, well, you know, can you tweak the camera? Can you do this? Can you do that? And we would recut it and change the timings and things like that. And that is where it gets, you know, previously to that, we're trying to work out the story and the general structure. That's where it becomes the actual shots and the actual film that you know doing. And so this is very different from from this is where the process is is overlaps live action and and and, and animation it, it diverges from both and it's its own unique thing and so what we would do um at pixar in particular is is and other studios to some extent but um i've never had as free a hand as i did at pixar um is to in a way start from scratch again in other words just like on a live action set okay we, we cut it we cut the story panels. The story panels were used by the layout department to generate. They tried to match them to, to a certain extent. Now we have the layout material back, the three-dimensional material back. And now I'm going to cut that rather than just match what I did before, which is the way it's mostly done. I'm going to cut that as if I'm now cutting live action and this is what I got. What's the best way to put it together? There's the way it was intended, but I tried to like look at it fresh. Okay, well, yeah. if I have these shots, how do I do it, right? And sometimes when there was time, they would venture into the realm. And some some other pictures I've worked on have done this, venture into more of a live action type realm of, in, of generating coverage, right? Most studios will not do that because it's expensive, right? And technically you don't need to. Generating coverage like you would have a live action set. In other words, material where some of it's not going to get used because some of it's overlapping and you just shoot it, shoot it a few different ways. Sometimes they would do that. And then it would be truly like, Hey, just cut it like live action. Just watch what's the best angle, whatever. And rethink it from don't just copy what we did before. And that l led to the very best, uh, but it's very expensive to do that. And um, it's yeah. the first place that a studio would try to try to save money. And we would work, go back and forth. We could change the shots. That's where you get the benefit of animation. You don't have a live action where you can say to the DP, can you change the shot that we already, that you already shot. Right. Yeah. And at the end of that, and then at that point, we would also have recorded the actual actors, their dialogue. And um, at that point, we would then lock in the timing. So at the end of the layout stage between there and animation, at the end of that, that's pretty much where the film has been set editorially. You try to you try not to have to change, you try to set all the timings and all the dialogue and all the frames and everything like that. Right. So that when the animators, it goes off to the animators and they're not really meant, unless they have a, this happens a lot, where they would have some brilliant brainstorm for some physical action that wasn't thought of before. And they would ask for permission to get a few more frames for that. To, but But the goal would be to minimize 
the changes from that point on. And then it gets animated to our timing. And then, and then, and then um, with a few tweaks, if the animators have some real brilliant, you know, stuff, which they always do ideas, you know, business to add. And then, and then, then, it, then it's more, then it's more that all the artists doing their, their, the making it look beautiful, you know, with the lighting and the texturing and the, the rendering and the, and then, and then letting the computers just, just for, for, for thousands of hours and everything like that. But it's really, it's really the computer animation. It's, it's that layout stage that is the unique stage that is, that is unique to all modes of, you know, that is diff similar, but different from live action, similar, but different from traditional animation. And that's where the film really gets, gets made. And, uh, and you know, and it's an editorial where we kind of lock it into place in that way. And it's not at the beginning and it's not at the end. It's, it's, it's kind of in the middle. Yeah. Were you surprised by any, or were you not surprised? You know, when, when, when anybody works on a film, like, you know, it's like that, whether you're a director, writer, producer, editor, everybody's like clinging on, like how people will react, right? Like for two reasons. Number one, will the audience accept the film and would the box office show? But sure. Let's just forget the box office, but let's just talk about the audience accepting it. Were you any by any means surprised by the way it was received, or was that something that you ex expected? No, I'm su yeah, surprised. Yeah, in a way, surprised. I mean, by that point, you know, by the time that those films get released, you've been working on them for so long. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I and, and you know, it's it's like with you know, I don't know. Do, do do you have children? I don't know if you have children. Yeah, I do. I do. Because I, yeah, I do, and and you know, as they grow up. Or you can see it in yourself as well, but it's easier when you're watching your kids. You know, they go through huge changes, but on a day to day, it's very rare. Once in a while, you'll say, "Wow, it looks like she grew up. <laughs> it looks like she got a little taller, you know, overnight or something." But, 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 you know, there's enormous growth. But it's, you know, from a, on a day to day basis, it's too it's too gradual. Like watching plants grow, you know, like you know, mushrooms. I guess you could almost watch grow, but regular plants, it's too slow to see. But it, but there's a huge change over not that long a time. So when you're when you're deep in the film, especially over years, and you're with it for the changes, you know when you know when you know the process, how it, how it was made, and what all the, th you know, you, you can't help but you can't quite you try. And I think it's the editor's job to try to be objective. And 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 one thing I try to always bring to the table is is to be a good viewer. And I I, I usually feel my my gut. I'm 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 I am able to sit in a room usually and watch something and say, you know, as a first time viewer, this is how I would react to it. Even though I've been working on it for, I am able to do that to yeah. a certain extent. And I try to preserve that. And it's one of the reasons why, for example, I always, um, I always request if at all possible to be able to look at something fresh in the morning before screening it for somebody, you know, to, to be able to go home, sleep, come in and try to look, look at it for the first, instead of having been looking, working on it all day and then show it, come in, look at it and just make sure my perception is still the same as what it was the night before, because, you know, I, I once you're deep into, so with the film, it's, it's that in spades. Um, and even though I, I, I thought it was entertaining, the idea that like, will people, to what extent will people truly get enthralled? is really is really i don't know I, it's it's like kind of magic and and with nemo in particular i mean i thought it was good i i th i knew i would like it you know but what other people will like you know there are lots of films that i see that i think like are not so great and people love them and you know yeah yeah but yeah. um <laughs> but so with nemo you know you have these test screenings um uh which you do with pretty much all the big hollywood studios yeah, and yeah. Um, there are companies that run them. So there's only a couple of companies that run them. And so, you, and, and there's only a couple of people that do them. So you get to know, you get to know the people, the responses. It's very, you, you're through it. Every film with the same, the same test, same, same people, the, the audiences, the people in the audience are the only thing that's different. And so with Nemo, we went out to on a theater in Ontario, not Ontario, Canada, but there's a small, you know, kind yep, of a, in California. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we went out to Ontario, California, which is a kind of far suburb, exurb of, of LA. Yeah. And um, we screened it. And then they, we, you know, we met, we met with the, with the, after it was over with the folks who crunched the numbers. 
And they said, they told us they were, it was the highest, it was the best response they had ever received. The numbers were almost perfect. Um, and I can tell you that having worked on lots of animated films since then, um, that's true. The n- numbers never come close to those numbers. Um, yeah. And they were so spectacular, those numbers, that I actually, a, a few years later, had dinner, a lunch with a, with a, a colleague who, from, you know, from a different studio who accused Disney or somebody of having lied about that anecdote because I guess they'd heard that story and saying that's not true it's not possible but it was true I was there I was there they weren't they weren't staging it for my benefit that's for sure so uh, the numbers were the highest ever so we did from that standpoint from the standpoint that the test audiences were giving it the highest score that that they had ever seen I think I could be misremembering but my memory is that they told us it was the highest score they'd ever seen uh, at the time um there was reason to be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I bet it 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 did it did because it was nearly like I didn't find anything, you know, too long, too quick. Like the beats, the the comedy beats, the the scenes, every the characters. Like you know, you you look at like I still remember the seagulls and the crab. Like it wasn't they weren't even main characters, right? Like you, you know, just just little droplets here and there. It was just perfect. Um, and and I think it, it 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 the box office results you know obviously show so that the and then they came up with a sequel Finding Dory, uh, which I thought was also amazing. But Finding Nemo for me holds more of a special place. It's probably because you know you watch it a certain time and certain period in your age, and uh, not that I was a kid, but still, I mean, you know, I I find that film just to be really up there. Um, so it it it. You know, obviously, it took a lot of years for you guys to to make it and to finish it and show it to the audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. It's, it's gratifying to hear that because, you know, when you work on something for so long, um, yeah. you, know, you don't know how it's going to be received. But but you also you want it to be. That's that's why we do it. Right. Because to to to, to leave something behind that touches people. Right. By the way, seagulls and the, and the crabs were, <laughs> both, were both Andrew. Right. The seagulls were Andrew and uh, and the crab. One of the crabs was Andrew. I think the other one was uh was John. Oh, okay. But Andrew's doing he's doing even though I guess it doesn't really make sense because it's like it's Australia, right? He's doing um he's doing a Boston, you know. Yeah. I, I, I was a little sure use me because I, I I was I was the I was the aquascum. Ah. But you, you know, know I I found you know when you were talking about research, right? For me, the biggest research, it's probably nothing to you guys. Because I used to go to dentist a lot. Right. Uh, like, you know, I, I used to have braces and everything. And and it was so perfect spot on with that fish tank in a dental office. Like it was just and I've been to so many dentist offices since then. Almost every one of them had a fish tank. And now, I mean, in terms of life imitating art now, I think, although, you know, some of them, it's not the case, um, especially as soon after the film came out. But even now, I, I think. The specific mix of fish you'll I, I don't think it's a coincidence that in a lot no, of places yeah that, that the mix of fish is the same from from nemo. from nemo i think they 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 specifically folks tried to kind of recreate that um but i know i i could be wrong but i, I vaguely i'm pretty sure that andrew was want his own personal dentist or so there's some personal dentist ex- experience <laughs> that he was kind of recreating there uh yeah <laughs> yeah you know you know you've had a cultural impact when you have people dentists uh, getting fish tanks and similar fish in their offices just to just to be, it, it made a big impact on people um you know from a character yeah. the message the message was phenomenal in the movie and it was just amazing it it had a little bit of elements of lion king like you know the father and son story like especially that i think that would re- that's what resonated with people yeah. More than anything else. So. Well, that was you know that was Andrew's in, in you know the impetus, the inspiration. To, you know he he he's told the story a number of times that you know he he I, know, I think he tells the story like his his young son at the time his young son you know he was 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 walking down the street he was he was walking he was kind of like walking along the edge of the curb and he kept saying don't be careful don't you're gonna fall whatever and then yeah. he said what are you doing you know I'm being so overprotective why am I doing this this you know and um and I I did not have children at the time. So, you know, it, it, you know, it resonates with me even more 
now, of course, you know, um, uh, if I had, a, you know, I, 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 um, it would have, anyway, I, yeah, it, it absolutely no, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. No, that's great. Um, David, um, I, I wish I could talk to you for more. Um, I just don't have time. We have another, have another meeting coming up, but I would love to, I mean, if you're up for it, I would love to talk to you. Absolutely. You know, more about yeah. other work, uh, whether it's Pixar or not Pixar. Uh, no, no, just, I, I, my favorite subject is, you know, film. Um, what what are you working on now? Are you working on any projects or are you doing something else? Well, yeah, you know, so so interestingly, the industry is in, a, in an odd place right now. I don't know if you're you're aware things yep. are, are, are a little, I think folks are waiting for potential writer strike and everything. Yeah, um, it's coming up. So I, I did this picture for uh for Paramount that that uh, we're still you know that that was meant to come out last summer. It's called Under the Boardwalk, and 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 actually a lot of what we talked about about underwater. There are a lot of underwater scenes about it's about crabs and in, in, uh, in New Jersey, and um, so a lot of that underwater stuff came into play here. There are a lot of scenes that you know, um, although this one also takes place more on the on the on the board under the boardwalk as well on the beach. Um, so that's a really fun musical. Um, mm. But um, we're waiting. We're waiting for the studio to. I think there's a lot of with streaming and everything that they haven't. There's just it's kind of constant changes in terms of in terms of the distribution. So that one was was meant to have come out this past summer, and it is going to see the light of day at some point soon. So there was that, and then um, and then there's uh, you know I was just uh, doing something at just finished up something at dreamworks that uh, i think we're waiting to hear if that's i can't i don't think i'm supposed to say much about it but um, no but we're waiting to hear if, if that one is going to get a green light or not you know because um because that's the way these things go and i'm talking yeah, to some yeah other. i get it so so there's a you know so uh you know you'll find out i'll, I'll probably you'll find out shortly after i will um yeah i well as long as you're keeping busy that's that's the oh key yeah thing. yeah there's always there's a lot of information being done and and developing my own stuff as well you know uh, yeah so yeah Wonderful. so fun. are you based Exciting in times. san francisco or la are you in la or san francisco LA, outskirts of la outskirts we bounce back and forth between san francisco los angeles and new york um yeah you know it's uh, now with remote work, it's, um, you know, we did the last, the, the entire last, not not this last thing that I did at DreamWorks, but the one before it for Paramount, COVID, I started two months before COVID. So not counting the first two months after that, the, the, the two years, uh, entirely uh, remote, 100%. And it was, uh, it, it was a breeze. It was actually, uh, it was actually easier in a way. So I guess you can be anywhere. I guess, I guess, minus the social interaction part, uh, which uh, depends. Sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. So I guess. Well, that's true. That's true. Where, where, where are you <laughs> at the moment? I'm I, in I, Toronto, Canada, but uh, I, I, I'm in states quite a bit. Uh, uh, like I'm going to be in San Francisco later this month, and uh, we're just doing a lot of screenings, and then I'm just talking to people about some projects that I'm developing, and uh, sure, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, if you're if you make your way to LA, you know you should you should. Uh, let me know. We, you know. Yeah, could... I would love to. I, it's possible, actually. When I'm coming to San Francisco, I'm trying to schedule a couple of meetings in LA, and if they go through, then I'll let, I'll be there and I'll let you know. No, fantastic. Yeah, it'd be great to meet up. And, and be like, happy to. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry. All right. What talk to you later. Oh, I was just gonna say, anytime you want, you know, you know, I'm always happy to go on about about filmmaking. Yeah, would love to, man. Love to. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon for sure. My pleasure. Okay, Talk to you later. Bye-bye.